All right, welcome back. Um, we had two questions from Jeffina during the break, both very valid. The first was, why did we ignore the passage at the end of chapter four, uh, which would basically be verses 43 uh, to verse 54? Um, OK, so um, we saw that Jesus was on the way back to Galilee. Uh, rather than confronting the, uh, the Pharisees, he chooses to return back. Uh, so on the way, he has the conversation with the Samaritan woman. And we kind of spent time on that uh, because this is a new community that Jesus is you know, uh, reaching out to. And moreover, he's trying to um, uh, impart some very important lessons uh, to even the Jewish people through this particular passage. He's showing this is the way you should be treating the other communities because the Messiah has not come only for the Jews. He has even come for all of the other communities of the earth. Uh, so that becomes a very important passage. And now after finishing his ministry over there with that lady, he comes back to Galilee. After returning to Galilee, um, he's given a slightly better welcome than earlier because now uh, some of the people who had seen him performing miracles at the festival, you know, those who had attended the festival earlier, they have uh, come back and given good reports about him. And so now this more greater openness towards, uh, towards him here. And it just talks about one miracle that was performed. Um, as we didn't have many um, you know, spiritual truths which we can gather from that, uh, we didn't quite dwell on it. But there is one point I think maybe maybe we should touch upon. Um, it says in verse 53, uh, you know, chapter 4, verse 53, the father realized, uh, OK, fine, maybe we should read from the earlier verse as OK. Um, maybe we can have one person read out. John chapter 4, verses 51 to 54. Yeah, John chapter uh, 4, 51 to 54, if someone could read out for us, please. I hope you have got back from your break. If someone could you know, just uh, open up to John chapter 4. Uh, if you could read out verses 51 to 54, please. John chapter 4, verses 51 to 54. And he was now going down. His servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same time in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and he, his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Amen. Yes. So uh, we saw that he gives a sign to the Samaritan community through that lady. And now here he's come back to Galilee, where you had the first miracle being performed, the very first miracle, the uh, one of the uh, water being turned into wine. So he's now come back to the same region. And uh, here there's a, uh, there's a child who is extremely ill, and the father requests him to please come and heal the child. And Jesus does not go back uh, along with the man to his home. Rather, he says, you know, just believe this child will live. He is healed. You just simply believe. And the father chooses to believe that. And uh, when the slaves come and meet him, they actually tell the father uh, at which point of time the the you know child began to recover and was completely healed. And the father realizes it is it is exactly during that hour when Jesus spoke those words and said he will be healed. Uh, so that helps this man and this entire household to place their faith in the Messiah. So um, these two signs are given to the people living in the Galilean region to indicate and tell them that this is the true Messiah. 
So these two signs are given to them specifically. And after this, it looks like Jesus again goes back to one, for another festival to Jerusalem, during which time you have the Pool of Bethesda event uh, taking place. So um, uh, here Jesus uh, uh, you know, helps this person by telling him to take up his bed and walk. And uh, we see that the Jewish leaders are not happy to see this man carrying his bed on the Sabbath day because they consider that as work and uh, they, they protest against against him. Uh, we would see that in verse in chapter 5 verses 10 and 11. Um, And the, uh, the 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 paralyzed man's reply is just basically this. He says in verse 12, then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? And um, uh, so he just simply replies and says that, uh, you know, the person who healed me, he's the one who has done this. And in verse 14, we see that maybe we can have... Um, oh, Maybe we can read out verses 14, 15, 16, and 17. Yeah. If someone can read out for us, chapter 5, verses 14, 15, 16, and 17. Chapter 5, verses 14, 15, 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Yeah. So um, the leaders consider carrying a mattress as work. Uh, they consider walking beyond a certain amount of distance as work. Um, they came up with a lot of rabbinical laws. Okay, Now, these are not part of the 613 commandments given by Moses. In the 613 commandments, which, the, which Yahweh divinely gave to the people, those are recorded in your Torah, in the first five books uh, of the Old Testament. Uh, so those are something which have been divinely instructed by God himself. But here we see uh, in the times of Jesus, the Pharisees, the rabbis, they all have come up with extra rules and regulations. So according to the human rules which have been given, um, you're not supposed to carry a sleeping mat. This is not a law that had been issued you know, by Moses earlier. Uh, so... When this man carried his mat, he was actually not breaking any divine law. He was breaking a human rule which had been imposed by the people, uh, but uh, it was not any divine ordinance that he was breaking. Uh, so this particular thing has been mentioned over here uh, by John the writer to bring out the point that the people are more interested in the rules and regulations which the paralyzed man is now following uh, or breaking rather than in his being healed after 38 years. The highlight of the entire story should have been a man was paralyzed for 38 years and now he's healed just because someone said, take up your mat and follow uh, and you know, take up your mat and walk. The man was able to do that. So that should have been the highlight of the entire story. But what happens is the anti-climax which takes place is that uh, you have people protesting and saying, oh, you carried a mattress, which is the bigger thing, that a man who was paralyzed for 38 years is now standing and walking and carrying the mattress. You know, uh, the healing should, be, should have received prominence, but rather the Jewish leaders, they place the highlight on his having broken a human rule. It shows the attitude, the hardened hearts of these uh, Jewish people. Um, so um, this particular portion was probably written by John the writer 
to highlight the complete lack of empathy and you know kindness uh, from you know from the on the side of the leaders towards those who are injured towards those who are hurting towards those who need help you know they do not care at all and in contrast in verse 14 you have jesus looking for this man to follow up on him it says here later jesus found him at the temple and said to him so it's like as if jesus had been looking for him you know uh, searching for him because there's something more that jesus wishes to convey to him so on one side you have leaders who do not care at all about this man who has you know uh, received such a miraculous wonderful gift after such a long time they don't care at all on the other side you have jesus who is now looking for him because there's something more that the holy spirit has revealed you know to him to convey and so when jesus finds him finally at the temple this is what the lord says see you are, you are well again stop sinning or something worse may happen to you uh, so this is when we get to know that the earlier um, you know sickness that had come upon him was probably a direct result of his sin and so now jesus has is telling him uh, that he needs to give up this uh, sinful lifestyle which he had led earlier otherwise something worse may happen uh, so the contrast here is between the leaders who do not care at all and jesus on the other hand who is searching out this person to convey the information which the holy spirit you know wanted him to convey and so from here we see uh, them moving into a new passage where jesus starts explaining you know why they should accept him and not oppose him when he is doing these signs He's performing these signs with a purpose to establish his identity, to reveal to them who he is. And so instead of condemning him and instead of opposing him, they should instead accept who he is. Uh, because if you remember, all these things which are written down over here, well, they were written down for the people of John's day. You know, when people were still coming into the faith, uh, they were still um wondering should we believe in this jesus who is being talked about or not so this written record has been given for people to know that jesus is the one who has been expected in the old testament and so they must place their faith in him so uh, john is writing these things he gives a uh, he gives us these episodes of healing you know these miracles which take place he writes that down and then he moves into a passage of teaching where Jesus is explaining, see, this is who I am. So first, the works are shown. The signs are recorded. These are the things which Jesus did. These are the almost impossible miracles, you know, which, would, which could not have been possible without the help of God. These were performed by Jesus. So that is established. And now John moves into the explanation part where Jesus is saying, I have been able to do all these things because of who I am. So um, we see that in verse 17, the last verse, uh, you know, which uh, Rosalind read out for us, where it says, in his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. So uh, why did I ask that person to carry his mattress? It's because my father is at work. He asked me to say this to this person, that he should carry his mattress and walk. And that's the reason I have given this instruction. And then he goes on to give in, uh, explain in greater detail what exactly is his relationship with the father. He talks about dependency, but he also talks about full, complete divinity. Both aspects are presented in the next few verses. You know, we will see that. Um, so maybe if we could read out uh, from verse 19, maybe up to verse 27. From verse 19 up to verse 27, if someone can read out, please. John chapter 5, 19 to 27. Yeah. Then Jesus answered and said to them, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than this that this that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he does. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the, fa honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into, ju into judgment, but has passed from, de from death, to uh, death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Yeah. Um, many points, uh, uh, many important points are there in this passage. Uh, so why did Jesus ask the person to you know, uh, pick up his mattress and walk? It is because the Father, the Heavenly Father is at work. And there are many things that the Heavenly Father is doing. And Jesus is directly partnering with the Heavenly Father in accomplishing these things. So he goes on to say in the next verse, he says in, in, in verse 19, he says, uh, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Uh, because whatever the father does, the son also does. So why is Jesus breaking human rules? Why is Jesus breaking man-made rules? Because he has received direct authority from the Father to, you know, to do these things, to give instructions to people to carry their mats, to heal people on the Sabbath day. All of these things are things which the Father has authorized him to do. So he makes it very clear, first of all, and says, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing. Um, the point that Jesus is bringing across over here is that he is a most reliable and faithful agent of the Father. Now, in the Jewish times, a, a messenger would be respected if he is a messenger who will really convey exactly what his master had told him to uh, you know, uh, convey. If a, if a messenger comes to a place and starts speaking on his own, and doing whatever he wishes, he would not really be a very faithful agent. So Jesus is saying, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only uh, um, act when I receive permission from the Father to do certain things. So he is bringing out the point that he is utterly reliable. He only does what he sees his Father doing. When he sees the Father in the spiritual realm, healing someone, he acts it out here in the earthly realm. Uh, when he sees the father in the spiritual realm, releasing a word, saying that something must be done, an instruction is given, Jesus speaks out that instruction you know, uh, physically over here on the earth through his mouth. So there's a direct um, relationship. Uh, there's a direct connection between what the father is doing in the spiritual realm and what uh, Jesus is enacting over here in the spiritual realm. So therefore, he says, you know, you must respect and accept what I am doing. So the readers who would have been reading this gospel for the very first time would read these instructions, these words of Jesus and, and connect the miracles that they, that they read about earlier and the instructions given over here. And they would, they would, they would think to themselves, yes, all that Jesus is saying in these words we must accept because the signs which he did, they were recorded earlier. And now the explanation for those signs is being given over here. So the readers would have read this and, and said, 
yes, whatever Jesus is saying over here has authority because we saw that he was not only spoke empty words, but he spoke words that he could actually back up with divine authority. Okay, so they would have been reading each of these sentences, keeping the miracles in mind. So Jesus next goes on to say, um, it is true that I don't do anything on my own, but this doesn't mean that I'm just some dependent, helpless um, messenger. I'm also divine. There are two sides to who I am. I choose to place myself under the Father and do only what the Father, what I see the Father doing. But on the other side, the other side of the coin is that um, I am able to give life in the same way the Father gives life. So I only heal when I receive instruction from the Father to heal. But the life and the healing which is coming out is not something that you know, I'm depending on the Father to provide. I myself have the power in me to provide the healing and the life. You see, is what he's saying over here. So he says, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. So on the one side, you have complete submission to the Father. But on the other side, Jesus is fully divine and able and capable to give life and healing um, on his own. So both these sides of who he is are being presented over here to the readers so that they fully understand that Jesus is also totally divine. Um, and so in the next sentence in verse 22, he goes on to say, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son. So on judgment day, it's not the father who will be doing the judging. It's in fact, Jesus Christ who will be doing the judging. So that is the level of authority which Jesus carries. And so therefore, he says in verse 23, the son should be honored in the same way the father is honored. And he goes on to clarify and he says, whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. So if you people think that you can um, you know, reject me, and still claim that you belong to God the Father, it doesn't work that way. If you really honor the Father, then you must honor the agent, the messenger whom he has sent. And this is not just a human agent, because this agent can actually give life, can bring healing on his own to the people that he wishes to give it to. So this is not just a human agent. This is a divine messenger who is on an equal footing with the Father. So these are all very uh, strong, important doctrinal truths which are being recorded in these verses. So for the first time readers who would have been reading these things, they would accept all these things which are written in these verses because the signs to prove them have already been given in the earlier verses. The miracles have already been recorded in the earlier verses. So they would um, you know, accept these words as authoritative. Um, then we uh, we also looked at, um, we read up to verse 27, right? So, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, so Jesus says in verse 26, as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. What does it mean? Here it's talking about how far the father always had life in himself. Nobody gave him life. Nobody created him and brought him into existence. He always had life in himself and he always existed. In the same way, even the son always had life in himself. It, uh, um, the father didn't create him and breathe life into him. No. So Jesus is establishing the fact that he is as divine as the father and that is why he again repeats in verse 27 he has given the father has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man um, so here of course the son of man is a reference to daniel chapter 7 we've already looked at that um, so this entire passage um, is bringing out the fact that the father and son are separate beings they are not one single person the father is separate the son is separate but 
they are equally divine and both of them equally have life in themselves nobody made them nobody created them uh, so this uh, you know goes against the um, that the modern um, group of pentecostals who say that uh, you know they have this jesus only doctrine where they say that jesus is the one who is fully divine uh, but uh, that would be a wrong doctrine um, because the father and the son are equally god um then we also have the other uh, the jehovah witnesses i mean who also say that you know jesus is not equal with the father so the, this passage these verses uh, can be used to show that the son and the father have equal authority they have equal life in them on their own without having been given it by anyone so these things are established through these verses these are good verses to use when we are talking to um, you know uh, people who uh, try to make uh, to bring out these wrong uh, teachings um, so uh, you know regarding the other question which uh, uh, jefina had asked uh, she had referred to john chapter 4 verse 2 where it, uh, john gives a small clarification um you know he says that actually jesus did not do the baptizing of the people who came you know to become followers it's the disciples who stood there and did it um because earlier in uh, chapter 3 verse 23 you know it says that jesus was baptizing and a lot of people were coming to him uh, uh, but the actual act of doing it was being done by the disciples yes the baptism was being authorized by jesus for the actual physical um, uh, standing in the water and immersing them inside and all of that was being done by the uh, disciples uh, so uh, in the same way uh, in his humanness jesus you know submitted to the father and only did what the father gave him permission to do uh, here we see the disciples adopting that same attitude whatever jesus gave them permission to do that they would do uh, so in a way jesus was showing them how authority works you know and how submission works uh, so jesus never needed to be under authority he is equally divine with the father but through his lifestyle through his actions he is showing his disciples how authority and submission work um so even though jesus had full authority he chose to place himself under the father and only do things in line with the father and now the disciples are learning that only what jesus permits them to do they enact it out and it applies the same thing principle would apply even to us today so only what we are being guided and led by the holy spirit uh, you know to do because this holy spirit you know is the spirit of god so whatever he is asking us to do we only do we only do those things um in line with his will uh, okay fine uh, well, let's move on to the next uh, thing mm, verses 28 to 30 yeah can be one section if we can have someone read out for us chapter 5 verses 28 to 30 please chapter 5 verses 28 but you do not have this word abiding in you because ah, 20, 20, no no so sorry 28 Uh, do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation i can i can of myself do nothing as i hear i judge and my commandment and my judgment is righteous because i do not seek my own will but the will of the father who sent me Okay, so, um yeah yeah he, he's continuing the theme about how there is a uh, one side where you see his his submission to the lord to the father 
uh, where he says only when the father gives me permission to the to judge i will judge so we see that but we also see the authority that he carries on the other side uh, where uh, these people who are going uh, when he calls out the dead are going to rise up uh, that's the you know point that is being made in verses 28 and 29 it says do not be amazed at this for a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out those who have done what is good will rise to life and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned the physical bodies of both the righteous and the unrighteous will be restored if a person has been burnt and you don't have the intact dead body even though that that person who died is now ashes the ashes will res get restored back into a resurrected body so jesus is going to carry the power to do that where dead people whether they have become ashes or whether they have the flesh has decayed and turned into uh, bones and soil whatever the condition may be the physical bodies of all the dead will be uh, restored and resurrected but the sad thing is that um, the unrighteous unable to exercise and you know, unable to enjoy the benefits of having a restored body once again will end up in hell where they will only experience pain whereas on the other hand a righteous person when they receive their resurrected and restored body they will be able to stay in heaven and be able to enjoy the benefits of having a resurrected body so even though the uh, unrighteous people also will receive resurrected bodies they're not able to enjoy the benefits of it when they are thrown into the fire they will only experience pain they are they're not able to enjoy the benefits of resurrection uh, and it's jesus the judge who will make all of this happen so that point is brought out over here in verses 28 to 30 um and then in verses 31 to 38 um jesus talks about how all these things that he is saying are based on um testimony which is backed up by others um maybe we can actually read it yeah mm. wait just a minute because um let's see how much more has to be covered fine um yeah let's let's read this uh if someone can read out for us verses 31 to 38 uh yeah uh, verse 31 up to verse 38 if i bear witnesses of myself my witnesses is not true there is another who bears witnesses of me and i know that the witnesses which i uh, which he witnesses of me is true you have sent to john and he has borne witnesses to the truth yet i do not receive testimony from men but i say these things that you may be saved He was the burning and shining lamb and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witnesses of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe yeah um here he's talking about who are the others who are testifying about him because in Deuteronomy 19:15 it says that a matter is established uh, by the mouth of two or three witnesses so if a person is just testifying about himself and saying okay i did not commit this crime i am innocent it will not be accepted you would need another two three witnesses who come forward and say yes we testify about that what this man is saying you know is true only then 
what that man has said about himself will be accepted as the truth. This was part of their legal system. So Deuteronomy chapter 19 talks about their legal system, talks about testimony which is acceptable and testimony which is rejected. So here, Jesus is basically referring to that. He's basically referring to Deuteronomy 19 and he's saying, I'm not just simply testifying about myself just like that without any backing. I am saying that I have other people testifying about me. And in this regard, he refers to the testimony given by John the Baptist. And he also refers to the testimony which is being given to him by the father directly. And he also talks about, uh, so there are two people that he refers to. You know, if you can um, refer to God, the father as people. Um, so John testifies about, John the Baptist testifies about Jesus. Uh, God the father testifies about Jesus, saying that both of them say that he is divine. And then he refers to two, two things. He talks about the works which he is doing. They are testifying about me, he says. And in verse 39, he goes on to talk about the scriptures, which are also testifying about me, he says. So technically, you can say that Jesus gives uh, four person, okay, two things and two persons as his backing. So the John the Baptist and God the Father are testifying about him. The signs and wonders that he's doing and the scriptures are also testifying about him. So these are the uh, this is the backing which he uses to build his case. Now, again, all of this would have sounded very um, legal and appropriate to the first time readers because you see, these are people from that background. So then they would see, yes, Jesus is not just simply talking about the works that he is doing, he's also bringing other factors, you know, here to show to us that what he is speaking, he's speaking with authority and legally he is. Um, proving to us that yes he is to be believed in okay so um when we cert when we read certain passages and they don't really make sense to us it would be good to ask ourselves how would it have sounded to them at that time because all these things were originally written so that it would make full sense to those people and they would be able to place their faith in Jesus. Now we take so many things for granted because we also have all the other epistles, you know, and we look to them as well to understand our doctrines. Uh, but uh, at that time, at the time of the early church, uh, they still did not have the entire New Testament was not with them. So when they, whenever they would be reading a particular gospel, they would, they would maybe some some churches would only have that one gospel to rely upon. So uh, whatever was placed whatever was written in, the, in that gospel every sentence would have mattered it would have counted it, it was meant to help them to build their faith in this Jesus who is been now being preached as the uh, fulfillment of the Messiah promise so um, so here Jesus uses the legal um, principles which they were familiar with to build a case and say see based on this I am saying that I am the uh, the Messiah to be accepted. And then Jesus criticizes, uh, you know, those who have not, who are doubting him and who are condemning him. Uh, and he says, this is what he says. Uh, and it's a good point which he makes. Um, if someone can read out for us verses 45 to um, 47, I suppose. Yeah, verses 45 to 47, if we can have um, yeah, someone read out. The last few verses uh, of chapter 5, verses 45 to 47. Um, do not think that I shall come accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuse you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So after having said all that he wishes to say, now Jesus says, you know, when the time comes, um, I will not accuse you before the father. Moses, whom you say that, you know, you are descendants of and whom you consider as your prophet, as your leader, uh, uh, he himself will accuse you because he has always talked about me. He has pointed towards me. And you you say that, you know, you have uh, your uh, your you're a, uh, you have 
learned his teachings that you have by hearted uh, you know the the torah and all of that so on that day when you uh, stand before the judgment seat i don't have to accuse you moses himself will accuse you because you failed to believe in what he wrote about me and we know that right that jesus constantly on many occasions uh, refers to the torah to the first five books and also the other old testament scriptures to talk about himself uh, to explain that all of those passages are actually pointing towards him uh, we see that um, we we mentioned we have mentioned this earlier this was on the um, you know uh, occasion when the when you had a couple of people going down the um, emmaus road the road to emmaus and then jesus uh, catches up with them starts talking to them and uh, he says to them this would be luke chapter 24 verses 25 to 27 uh, and he says to these uh, people who are walking down the road uh, to emmaus he says to them in verse 26 he says how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken did not the messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory and beginning with moses and all the prophets he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself uh, some of the main passages which talk about jesus from the old testament um, that would be deuteronomy 18:15 which uh, talks about in which moses says there will be another prophet like me and you shall hear him is what he says so that refers to jesus then you have of course the bronze serpent that uh, is referred to in numbers 21 uh, so in the jesus says in the same way the bronze serpent uh, was lifted up i too will be lifted up so that also was directly pointing towards jesus the bronze serpent of the old testament was pointing towards jesus um, he is also compared to the rock you know in first corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 so we know that that uh, raw, jesus uses um, god the far um, okay we would not be um, speaking about the triune god in the old testament we just simply refer to him as yahweh but yahweh was made up of father son and holy spirit okay so uh, the yahweh of the old testament uh, he uses a rock to bring bring out water from because that will point towards Jesus. Uh, so that again is, a, is something which points towards Jesus. All the seven sacrifices which are mentioned in your, um, you know, in your Leviticus, they all point towards Jesus. The, the blueprint of the tabernacle, you know, the way that it was made, uh, you, you know, you had the open courtyard in the front uh, where you had that, uh, that bronze um, container with the water in it. And then the altar over there and then you walk towards the the actual building where you first have the holy place and then finally you have the most holy place every one of those things actually uh, refers to jesus uh, for you to have get a detailed teaching of that i mean you would probably have to go on google and if you type uh, how does the tabernacle structure point towards jesus you would find articles which explain that so every single article item and the very structure of that tabernacle all of it actually is pointing towards jesus so that also speaks uh, about him and then there are certain passages which talk about the bond servant even some of those passages also refer to jesus um exodus chapter 21 verses 5 to 6 where it talks about the law of the bond servant that also actually points towards Jesus. So in fact, there are many, many scriptures in the Old Testament, all of which talk about um, the Messiah who will come one day, even though they're not direct references, they all actually are pointing towards Jesus, which is why uh, Philip in John chapter one, he say, uh, you know, um, Philip says to Nathaniel, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. So um, Philip, Nathaniel, and other people like him, even though they were not uh, the they were not Pharisees, they loved the scriptures enough that they had studied these things. You know, they they talked about what Moses wrote and what the prophets wrote because those are things which they had been actually learning on a on a regular basis. And you know, we have people who very casually dismiss them as fishermen and um, you know things like that. But these were people who actually had been studying the writings of Moses. 
they had been studying the writings of the prophets in other words they had actually been studying the old testament even though they were fishermen okay so uh, we are not we are not dealing with an ignorant bunch of people these were people who had prepared their hearts to become disciples long ago and so jesus picks them uh, you know to be his followers uh, so the old testament did point towards jesus and talk about him um just one oh my we we are out of time as usual um okay just one thing that i wanted to talk about uh, you know verse 43 verse 44 uh, jesus makes a comment it's it's a good comment he says i have come in my father's name and you do not accept me but if someone else comes in his own name you will accept him how can you believe since you accept glory from one another but do not seek the glory that comes from the only god main point being made over here you know people are so interested in the opinion of others in getting their praise in getting glory from them that they value what people say but they don't value what god says so um we should be more concerned with god's opinion because when we are more concerned with god's opinion we add weight to his words we value them we trust them we obey them we follow them all of that we do because we for us his opinion matters more on the other hand when people's opinion matters more we immediately start um you know, prioritizing our priorities according to what they will find favorable so um one main thing that jesus says about, about over here about why they were finding it difficult to become his followers is because they they gave greater weightage to what people thought and what people stated as being important so these things which jesus is writing out over here he says if you really valued the father's praise then you would you know focus more on these words than on what people are teaching uh so um you know even as we are going through these chapters in which again and again jesus establishes his divinity he talks about authority and submission and all of that if we actually value what the father thinks more than what people think then we will give greater weightage to these words and try to understand them and practice them and follow them and because all of you you know who are online and watching this and even those who later watch this on you know, on the e platform the reason that you people are doing that is because somewhere in your heart you value him you value what he thinks finally in the end when you stand in front of the judgment seat you want the words of praise to come from his mouth and that is the only reason why you have joined this course so that you can learn what is being taught in these verses grasp those truths and apply them in your lives so that on that day the words of praise will come from his mouth and he will say yes you have followed what i taught and you actually trusted those words and practiced them in your life so you want that that shows that your priorities are right so you know may you continue to walk on this path which you have chosen just the way those fishermen made the choice you know long back uh and uh, so yes we'll close with a word of prayer uh if there were any questions you know i would have answered but i think no one has any questions because no one has posted anything and nobody raised a hand so fine you know we'll just close with a word of prayer there's so much that we covered today oh lord uh from your scriptures um and lord we we briefly touched upon some truths but i pray oh lord that you would imprint these truths on our hearts in the days to come Lord I pray that in the same way uh, you interacted with that Samaritan woman we too will learn to minister to our own communities respecting them treating them with dignity but at the same time uh, emphasizing the truths Jesus never said it was all right for her to continue living in sin he never said that uh, but Lord at the same time uh, he showed respect and dignity help us a oh lot to reach out to our communities in the same way i pray oh lord that we will point out the sin in their lives we will ask them to change their ways but we will do it with love showing them respect uh, so that lord the work that we do will be effective 
and bear eternal fruit. And I pray that we would be guided by the Holy Spirit in everything in the way that Jesus was guided, O oh Lord, so that we would uh, always um, do our work in a way which will bear the greatest fruit and the greatest results. We just commit ourselves into your hands, O oh Lord. You guide us, you lead us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for listening. And I had multiple people reading out for us today. We just thank you so much for that. Yeah. See you again next week. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much.